Mm. So welcome everyone. Today we have a special guest, um, Pastor Paul, who's been doing some incredible work with a recent court case, which we've um, had a huge response from our supporters. So we wanted to invite him on today and just find out some more about what's happening and how we can help as well. So welcome, Paul. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thank you, Gabby. Thank you for inviting me. Always a pleasure. Welcome. Mm. Yeah, tell us about tell us about the case because that was was it last Friday? I'm losing track of time. Uh, it was actually Wednesday last week before Justice Wednesday. Justice Button. Yeah, this this has been an ongoing thing, Gabby. But um, a bit of brief brief background will help people know where we get why we got to where we're at now. But what we're doing. But over four years ago, myself and another gentleman, Dr. Andrew Catalaris, were charged for breaching Section 105 of the. Children and Young Persons Care and Protection Act, New South Wales, 1998, which is to say or identify the name or image of a child, and in this case on social media. Interestingly, in the case, four million other people were doing the same thing at the same time, and we were just the two people targeted, and we believe for um, inappropriate reasons they chose us specifically because we were victims in the situation when the child was removed. And it was always our view that they were using... 105 not to protect a child but to protect their actions that were unlawful in our view so um, we were charged with a number of offenses court suppression breaking court suppression orders that we were not aware of because we weren't in the children's court back then and also uh, breaching 105 and Andrew and I fought that fervently for lots of grounds and if you're not aware in in New South Wales it's a two-year indictable offense which actually qualifies for the right to elect a jury so the first thing we did was elect a jury because we felt with a jury trial we'll get justice because we just have to tell 12 people in the public exactly what's going mm. on. Yeah. Um, but what happened in that process, so there was a long process. They accused us of releasing information and I then asked, well, what, inform- what medical information? And, uh, and they said, we're not going to tell you. And I said, well, you can't tell me I've released medical information and not tell me what it is. It was just all very, very, the whole thing was, in our view, really, I don't know if nefarious is the word, but it was just messy. Mm-hmm. So... Um, in that process, we took out what was called a constitutional challenge. You have a right in New South Wales. It's a Judiciary Act. I think it's the Federal Act, but I think it's Section 78. I can't remember exactly. But mm-hmm. you have the right to raise a constitutional challenge. And we argued that Section 105 was constitutionally invalid um, because it's so wide in its construct for parents that what happens is from a moment a child's removed in New South Wales, mm-hmm. the parents are effectively completely silenced from talking about what happens. And yeah. under the and the legislation is so draconian that it's actually technically okay, it's also what's called a strict. I have to explain this. It's called a strict liability offence, which means it doesn't have what's called mens rea, which means you can't really argue your intent for doing it either, which makes it even worse. So, what it does effectively is a parent could get charged for a two-year indictable offence and not be able to argue it for wishing their own child a happy birthday. Mm-hmm. Right. That, that's how ridiculous this thing is. So we just argued, we raised a constitutional yeah. argument in the local court in New South Wales, in Newcastle. Um, we were unsuccessful on the local court level before Magistrate made, and he looked into it in some detail. He took us very seriously, and we argued our specific case and everything. Um, but we were unsuccessful, so we then appealed it to the Supreme Court, and that was last Wednesday, the hearing. Mm. So all these things take process. Remember, we've been in court for nearly four years. Oh, sorry. What a marathon. Yeah, so, so, and this is just one, because we've still got suppression on us in equity for a child that's been fully restored back to his parents for two years, yeah. full custody returned back to his family who are now in another jurisdiction. Yeah. Um, and it was always recognised that there were errors in what they did. They, they had no grounds. And this was our whole point, saying, that if you know, what this law does is it removes anyone the right to challenge or question the government on any level. And I don't know how many of your viewers will be aware, but in New South Wales, child removals are are largely warrantless. There's not not even a warrant. There's no judicial Mm. oversight. These social workers with minimal skills, in my view, just make up rubbish quite often. They criminalise parents. They then come and rip their children. The chances of anyone getting a child back is about as close to zero as you get. It's just disgraceful. Even if everything was found to be wrong, you're looking at two years before, in some cases, to reach establishment. So I'm digressing, but the background's important. So one, yeah, exactly. And I guess how many parents are in the position to take these people to court, or you know, know their rights as well. So it's it's really um, 
yeah, it's just threatening tactics, isn't it? It is. Um, you know, there's a massive what we call like social empowerment issues as well. Yeah. Like you said, a lot of parents have got no skills. Legal aid's fallen off now. And most of the time, they just kind of sell the parents off with the, against, in New South Wales, it's DCJ, mm -hmm. the Department of Communities and Justice, <clears throat> that was facts, that was docs. The names are different, but they're similar principles. Yeah. So, so um, Justice Button took our argument very seriously, but not only did we raise a con the constitutional invalidity of 105, because we're saying it's unconstitutional mm. to completely break down someone's freedom of political communication. You can't challenge the government and say, well, they've taken my child unlawfully. Yeah. So if someone, and they, so these, pe these parents are completely shut down, and not only are they shut down, but they can't even express love for their child which yeah. is so frustrating. So yeah. I'm dealing now on a weekly basis with these traumatised parents. Um, it's disgraceful. I mean, we know people who actually go into the International, international Criminal Courts about these matters because it's so Definitely. disgusting what's happening to these parents. That yeah. they, like, like they're frustrated, you know, and I'm amazed more caseworkers haven't been beaten up and shot, to be honest. Um, yeah. I'm, I'm astounded that these people are still able to be, yeah. you know, hold on to their humanity. So Justice Button took our argument very seriously, and I felt that I argued very well. It was open to the public, so a lot of people heard. I think you may have even heard. Um, but I listened to yeah, the fantastic job of presenting it, um, and it was really easy for people to understand like really much they know already i think it was explained really really well just the complete loss of parental rights and it's just to, just to even be able to speak out about your child being removed let alone it being wrong or right it's just um horrific isn't it yeah because I, I what happened is i had to argue because of the covid restrictions and because it was on avl you know on a video link up and not in person which we were always hoping to get a gallery for this and have a bunch of parents come in and watch this because with that was andrew andrew and i always wanted to get up some some real social energy around it you know public power around this because so many yeah. people impacted and we're trying yeah. to help parents overcome their fear because a lot of parents you'd be aware dealing with this if they're frightened yeah, to stand up you know, and we believe there's a lot more of them than even we realise. And we're talking yeah. about thousands. We're talking thousands in New South Wales. This is not a small matter. So you, you think it can um, affect thousands in just New South Wales alone? Yeah, is I do. Definitely. Correct? Definitely. Yeah, um, yeah definitely. There's It'll no to... reports. Like, there's no reports. No, you. and I know hundreds myself, but I know over a period of time dealing with them that we're dealing with thousands. I mean, even yeah. if you look at statistics released by the government, the things we can talk about, DCJ themselves, facts, docs, uh, their figures come out to around about 98, depending, it varies a bit, 98 to 100 children die in their alleged care in, the every, in every year, right? Yeah. So so that's, um, a, in the last 10 years, that's 1,000 dead children that they acknowledge. So yeah. the figures will no doubt be more. And that's, I'm not talking about child removals, I'm just talking about children that died. That's um, you know, And remember too, with uh, one... It sorry. shouldn't be. That, that rate is just so high, like it's just... Why, why is that happening? It's just, yeah, yes, it's just disgraceful that that's not being investigated. Um, people, you know, New South Wales and Australia actually overall, I think in my understanding, but definitely New South Wales per capita mm. leads the world for child removals more wow. than any third world country or anywhere right? else. Yeah, so you have to ask yourself, why is that? Who is it serving? Yeah. What What is that about? And we do know with the Indigenous in this country, with our black brothers and sisters, this has been an ongoing thing for a long yeah. time. And um, the trauma that's caused them has absolutely decimated their culture, yeah. which is why it's so hard to, to find really strong, and I don't mean to be disrespectful, but to find really strong um, Koreas, I don't really know. I, we don't even know what to call them because you call them Indigenous and it's like a... a First Nations, I think, is probably the closest. Yeah, sorry? It's hard. First it's hard. Nations. First Nation, I used for a while First Nation because the oh. original custodians or whatever, and then I ended up going with, with Auntie Mimi from the Grandmothers Against yep. Removals, who was a very good friend of mine, the original one who's passed yep. now, um, who really got me involved in this whole thing. Um, you know, she just said, just call us black fellas. <laughs> you know, and I went, okay, <laughs> you're going white and you're black, that works, you know. Um, yep. But I feel for them, and uh, but this problem now, the net's much, much wider. So... I'm dealing with a lot of migrant families. There's one gentleman whose name I cannot mention because it's suppressed, who's currently in Villawood, right? Um, I suppose I can't even say, I mean, he's Filipino, but I'm going to say it anyway because that poor man, they took his children seven years ago and he spent a million dollars of his own money, lost his entire everything he owned, fighting to get them back. And now he's like a, 
I don't mean to be, again, disrespectful, but the poor man's broken. Yeah. And we're trying to get him out of Villawood, and they want to deport him back to the Philippines for basically talking about his own children because he says they were stolen because yeah. they were. Exactly. Um, Why can't he comments like it, it's it's free speech, isn't it? Like it's just horrendous. It's just horrendous, you know. And and yeah. for for people like myself, and we've got the Family Preservation Network. There's a whole national alliance now of volunteers like me that are all working together, helping families, doing what we can because the system's a disaster. And I mean, we're even contacting embassies saying, like, can these parents seek asylum? Because then wow. I don't think you're going to get judicial. You're not going to find a judicial remedy, not in the children's court, certainly not in New South Wales. And mm. I'm, I'm in there at the moment desperately trying to encourage, I don't know what you'd call it, you know, it's almost like forcibly, judicially massage them into doing the right thing. Yeah. Um, but it's, it, yeah. yeah, it's just not happening. The children's courts in, in particular, because they're closed from the public. I, I don't, I'm not starting to go like, how did, what, that, how did yeah, that happen? It's and just, It's just so wrong that it's a closed court when it's about children. Like, what are they hiding? What are they um, hiding? You know, this is, and this is the other reason for, again, addressing 105. And our argument was, yeah. look, you know, if it has a place in law, then the yeah. place would only be to protect a child from stigma. Oh, you know, sure. like from hearing negative commentary. So if you had a shocking case of a child that was sexually abused, they don't want everyone at school talking about, sure. you know, his rape. I mean, obviously, that, that's common, part of it. Yeah. common but, sense. And I, I think most parents would get that. But what else does it protect? Because it's as if all the public's going to go out and attack a child that was raped and say bad things about them. I mean, that's ridiculous. Um, the concept's ridiculous. I mean, most people I know are good people. Like, they're, they're not, it's very rare to find there are vindictive individuals, but that's a very rare thing. Yeah. Um, so we're trying to get this declaration as well, and Justice Button's got to think about that really seriously because by doing that and limiting it to stigma only, that mm. then open, that opens up parents for expression of love for a yeah. start so they can express their love for the children. So that takes that massive barrier off Amazing. if we're successful, you know. Um, and 105 itself, he, he even, you know, I, my one, I don't want to say failing, but what I would like to have done upon reflection, you know, we always like to think yeah. afterwards about <laughs> how we could have done things better. Um, yeah. I really wished I'd actually drafted 105 myself and then said to him, when he said to me, like, you know, what do you want me to change here, Paul? Wow. Paul I yeah. would have said this, you know, but I think I got my argument across still anyway, because firstly, <laughs> Strict liability is ridiculous because to take away the mens rea, the intent is nuts because that does make wish acts of love a crime. That can't be constitutional. Yeah, know? exactly. Uh, so th that would be a start. The other thing is it's so wide in this way it's written, like, you know, if a child was or is or reasonably likely to be in care and can be seen in New South mm. Wales, which technically means anyone in the world could be charged, mm. For a New South Wales, New South for New South Wales legislation, right, and was or is or reasonably likely to be. Well, I would argue with the net being so wide and the number of parents being impacted now, particularly with COVID, it's getting worse at yeah. an alarming rate. I'd argue that was or is or reasonably likely to be would actually be every child in New South Wales because it is anyone could be yeah. now because you know you could lose a child for not attending a doctor's appointment for your fridge yeah. not working for not having a fire alarm um yeah. i'm kidding I'm, i mean people, people, people laugh but it's it's that bad yeah but like what you were saying then it's important you know for our supporters to realize that too like some of these reasons that the dcp are coming in and removing children are that bogus um you know i've had parents contact us and it's been about a gluten intolerance or like you said a doctor's appointment um, you know, these are ridiculous um, new charges that these parents are having brought up. And then they're having their children removed and they can't actually speak out about it publicly for fear of the courts um, charging them. So it's just a horrific situation at the moment in Australia. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely mm. horrific. And I, I couldn't agree more. Like, it's the cases, and I said, it's hearsay, innuendo, and accusations. It's not evidence. Yeah. The children's courts balance the probabilities. The parents are criminalised when they have a child removed, like you're a criminal for doing something, mm -hmm. but there's no criminal act and there's no jury, you know. So it's just, 
it's unbelievable. Like, and I said, uh, I, I actually, before this conversation today, I ended up helping mm -hmm. another gentleman ask me on a Zoom meeting and I jumped on and I was actually talking to a barrister who was a extra, actually a former children's court magistrate, uh, uh -huh. solicitor and a couple of other people. So I'm suddenly finding myself in very... <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> For a guy that spent many years as a musician, I mean, I've been a pastor and doing a lot of spiritual work since about early 2000, 2003, 2004. But right. nonetheless, I've spent a lot of my life making money as a musician. I'm like, I'm, I'm kind of going like, how did I end up here? <laughs> how did this happen? You know, I, and I think, You're cold. Cold yeah, sure. I think yeah. it started with Auntie Mimi um, from the Grandmothers Against Removals, mm. Elizabeth Humble. Um, she's passed now, but. She was out in northwest New South Wales, and I was a, a staunch environmentalist. So I was helping against the, the protecting the indigenous sacred sites. They were detonating the women's site out there, and they put yeah. a train line through the burial grounds. It was just horrible. And I got involved with the mob out there, uh, Gomorrah Gamilaroi mob, and you know we actually all got initiated with them as well because we were so supportive. There was a lot of good people, and we held vigils. But I, I became aware when she started talking about her grandchildren and how she could hardly ever see them and she was getting two yeah. hours a month and I said this is wrong auntie you're really yeah. lovely you're, I've stayed in your home you cook well you're really nice your son's great this makes no sense I'll yeah. help you get your children back you know and I made her this promise I said you know auntie I'll promise you I'll help get your children back and I never realized <laughs> I laugh because it's so tragic but I never realized at that point what? exactly <laughs> what kind of promise right. i was making <laughs> i i had no you idea you know yeah. i had no idea how bad it is until you start you know hearing these stories from parents no. and you know, it doesn't take long before you realize how horrific our court system is and it's not serving the children it's not serving them in any way or the families no. No, the children's yeah. court is a disaster in my view, and it's not. And I'm not quite sure what's going on. I, <clears> I'm, I'm still wanting to believe that maybe the magistrates are just being horribly misled. But I'm getting to this point now where I'm going. I don't know anymore. I really, in that yeah. court, um, how many I, times they get it wrong? Really, it's just and and maybe because of all the paperwork, they just they just rubber stamp DCJ and believe that you know, yeah. tons of paperwork means truth, but it's not. Yeah. It's it's shocking. So. I don't know what we can do. Um, we encourage parents to one at this point. It's so bad. We encourage them now to self-represent because just about every legal representative, legal aid or otherwise that we've encountered, all of it, but about one or two. So you're mm -hmm. talking about a less than 1% chance of getting somebody really, really good. Doesn't mean they don't exist, but they're very hard. Yeah. We encourage them to self-represent and we also <laughs> help them engage with the paperwork they need, putting in Form 2s and getting other family members to put in for parental custody, just to actually challenge the system and get in there and help them with their own affidavits and say, when they give you these 500 pages of rubbish, look through it and try and see what they're actually arguing their grounds are and then challenge the, every one of them with whatever you've got yeah. and lawfully challenge. And we also encourage parents, as difficult as it is, we've even helped a couple of cases uh, apply directly to the Supreme Court for an urgent injunction under parents' patri jurisdiction, which is the where the Supreme Court handles children. Mm. And we haven't had success ultimately, but we did get another child back in Victoria doing this. Um, wow. And we've only got really two of many that we've actually got back because it's so hard. But and that, I think that's... That was more, my I was going to ask how how many times is successful in challenging these um, you know, ridiculous. No, no. The only the only true success story is the child in question that I still yeah. have to be careful around in our manner for four years. That many many people know anyway, and I mean it's almost like because he's back in the control of his parents completely. Um, mm. But it, in me, in my view, that's the first real one. But having said that, I did have a uh, justice Priestley in a district children's school say to me, Oh, we give children back all the time, Pastor Paul, you know, we, we do mm. restoration all the time. But it's like, no, no, restoration oh, yeah. isn't restoration. You know, um, yeah. restoration is jumping through the hoops of DCJ. And if you step out of line even slightly, or you suck it up, or you make one negative comment about the department, your child's gone. You know, like it's more like a, the acts of a kidnapper. You know, and yep. this is why they don't like to be called child stealing kidnappers. But this is why parents call them it because I did say that. If you heard that, I'm not sure if you were listening at that time when our, in our live um, with Justice Button. And I do appreciate that mm -hmm. you allowed me to do that live and let it go live. But yeah. I, was, I was arguing that with him. I said, "Look, you, I, I, I tried to be respectful, but I said this is has the attributes of a kidnapper. Like so, because if you say I don't like what the department did, then mm -hmm. they'll just cut you off from your kids." Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, yeah and then coming back with all these terms and conditions and making th- these families jump through hoops to hopefully get their kids back. Like, mm. yeah, families yeah, together, like, wherever possible, and it just seems like these courts are coming at it from completely the wrong direction. Like, they're just removing children and there's no no um, area where parents can challenge that without running into, you know, more issues of being charged themselves. No, they don't. And I, my concern yeah. too is I think... Um, Gabby, which is really important, is one around social stability with coronavirus making it even worse and some parents yeah. just getting 30 minutes and not getting any contact with their own yeah. biological children, many of I whom should, should have not have lost them in the first place. Um, this is a recipe for disaster. I can say firsthand, I know members of the community. I know particularly some of the migrants from from war-torn mm-hmm. countries that they've had enough. I actually know one gentleman, in fact, I know two or three that have actually got all of the addresses of all the caseworkers and magistrates and everything, and these people have had enough. Like, I, I'm really distressed, and I, I'm i talking. To that point, though, haven't they? Like, what, They're pushed. You know, every avenue to, like, tackle it legally. Like, people are going to take matters into their own hands. Like, it's going to go. and. I think I think it's almost like you know with martial law in New South Wales pushing its ugly head and what's going on in yeah. Victoria. We're, we're months away from like what appears to be civil war, and people may not realise it because we've had right. it too too good in this country for too long. But yeah. you've got to realise that these things happen, and it's on its way. Um, I can see a lot of parents just going and grabbing their children back, and I wouldn't want to be a caseworker, um, no. you know, because they're what they've got blood on their hands. Seriously, they're um, broken. Families, yeah, and often these children are being put in dangerous situations, as we well know. Children are much likely to be abused outside of home as well. So they've got yeah. a lot of blood on their hands, don't they? Yeah. Well, that, that's what we also do with children in the cases, and they don't like it in the children's court, but we encourage parents to put in some of the reports, that out-of-home care one. There's an amazing one on the Indigenous, ah. uh, the Tune report, Wood report. There's about mm-hmm. six on my website I've got up, but they're all really well written. And, you know, children like six Point five times more chance of being physically assaulted in care. Uh, yeah. Six, I think it's about the same for sexually abused in care. Um, yeah. 15 times more likely. There was one other that was really shocking and it was like, and 100% of the time they come out emotionally damaged. Um, and the out of home care one was just shocking that the federal police released recently, which it was like the, the children that were homeless in Australia, I think mm-hmm. was one one percent of all children yeah. Um, however, it was like at the time of the study, it was 74% of them were from out of home care in the system. Exactly. So it's just out, exactly. of control, out of control. It's not working. It's completely out of control. Mm. And there was um, all the reports done on the, the state care in Victoria just recently where nearly 40% of children in state care actually reported being sexually abused. Yeah. You know, our rings involved with that as well. And it's like these systems are not protecting the children in any way anymore. They just they need to be dissolved completely. I've just had a couple of people come in. I might just let them know oh. that I'm doing this with you. Just bear with me one <laughs> second. Yeah, no worries. <laughs> So I've just instructed the, the lovely the lovely people here just to, to to tread and walk lightly and not stomp around too much and dance and sing and play great hits from the sixties. <laughs> I'm up. Yeah, before, sorry. Um, do you find it's mainly females or males or girls or boys? I should say um, that are is it is it more one sex than the other that are being removed from home from your experience? I, I'm dealing a lot with very what I would call PTSD females largely. Um, having said that, there are some males as well, but there are much higher percentage of females to males. Um, mm-hmm. There's been a lot of conversations as to what's happened to the men. Um, to be mm-hmm. honest, because the male role of defending a family, I thought, um, we're a little bit dumbfounded. Having said that, there are some staunch males I know that I have helped in court. I can think of two that come to mind straight away, but mostly the mothers. But they tend to target, you know, got to remember that this system works on division and they yes. tend to target the vulnerable as well. So single mothers are easy targets because single mothers are not going to put up much of a fight. And yeah. Again, I, I can't say it on social media because the fixated persons union, I do know some people keeping an eye on me, but I have to be very careful what I say because I'm not obviously can't encourage or condone violence of any, any kind. But 
in my view personally my personal position if they come from my child or grandchild in my case being a bit older um i i knowing the system is how bad i would use all force that's reasonable up to mm. and including lethal force if absolutely necessary to make sure they yeah. don't take my child because the, i'm not getting that child back yeah. right so and it's exactly. terrible of me to say, but if they came and I knew it was unjust and there was no right or justification, I would do everything I could to kill the caseworkers. And it's yeah. terrible coming from a minister of religion to say something like that. But this is, this is the shocking reality yeah. um, for people because you're not going to get a trial by jury. You're not going to get that. But if you do it criminally, you will. There, there was actually a lady I'm helping up in Queensland who did just that. They ripped a one-year-old child off her that she was breastfeeding, you know, and she was so, so angry, she yeah. jumped on top of the caseworker and beat the yeah. living shit out of her. And mother's rage just comes straight out. You know? And, and I, 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 she's got no contact with the children, of course, but that was part of the problem. She didn't anyway. And the reason she did that is when they ripped the one-year-old, just said, you're never going to see this kid ever again. You know, and this poor lady's already been in the system. She's a victim of abuse. She's a really good person. She needed support. She's never had it. She's just mm. been targeted in this disgusting system. Yeah. Um, so we're trying to support her and she's pleading not guilty, you know, and they said, oh, you can't because it's clear that she did it. We've got CCTV footage showing her beating up the caseworker. You know, she just went ballistic. Um, oh. And it's bizarre because, you know, someone else we know put up a news report about it because no one wants to write about this stuff. You know, and Charles McGavin, I think I was exposed, put up something about it. Oh, and, okay. Yeah, and yeah. about yeah. there was about 900 views in a matter of minutes and comments. And every single comment was bizarre. They all said, good on you. You yeah. should have killed her. You know, stuff like that. I've never seen anything like it. I, I didn't see one comment that said, how could you do that? Yeah. You know? I, and I actually, yeah, I'm sorry. Oh, no, I was just saying people are getting pushed their backs into that corner and they know that, you know, once their kids are out of their sight, what what are their choices to, you know, yeah, have, I, have the case heard? So it's getting I, to that, isn't it? Yeah, I, I don't understand, Gabby, how they don't recognise that we're human beings. Like there's this thing like, I mean, when I was raising this argument with a legal aid guy for this lady um, to try and help her get legal aid, because it's hard for me to get a voice, is I'm an advocate, but I can do an amicus curiae. I might get a voice in a court matter, but it's hard for us people that are not lawyers. They don't like us in there because we give families hope and a chance, is my <laughs> view. Um, yeah. But they, they couldn't perceive it. And, neither, and I also had a meeting with three caseworkers about this, and they looked at me stunned. And they said, we've never seen somebody beat up one of our caseworkers like that. It's so disgraceful. How could they do that? And I'm saying, well, have you ever have you ever seen somebody try and take a little baby off a silverback gorilla? I said, or a giraffe, or a wallaby, or a duck, or a goose. And then I think, in fact, any animal on the planet. What don't what part of being a mum don't you get? But they, they don't understand that. Yeah. Uh, and even in the court, it's like there's something wrong without us having that part in our nature and, and i mean i'm very spiritual but i'm going like well what is that because yeah why don't they recognize that that primary rage that exists and why don't they accept that rage. as being part of what we are oh yeah it's mm. like they've lost all all trace of humanity yeah mm. yeah they are like aut automatons or something it's bizarre yeah. you know what? yeah, yeah so, so, so what's next for um for the case after last Wednesday, so I, I I thought the judge seemed quite um I, I thought he seemed quite receptive to it all actually. He I, I liked him a lot. Um, yeah. I dealt with a lot of judges and magistrates now, and I actually must say I've met quite a lot of really that I think are really astute and doing most probably what they can in a very difficult system. Um, yeah. I, I, I I wonder about the separation of powers because they're paid by the same government and their ability to be truly objective. But outside of that, I think he was inquisitorial. Like we have an yeah. adversarial system in this country and it's not worth about stopping evidence and blocking yeah. things. But he, he really wanted to flesh it out with me and I felt like I argued well and I felt like I made my points well. So I think he's got a lot on his plate. So his reserved judgment, I, uh -huh. I don't... I don't see him coming out of the judgment for at least a month or two or possibly three. They wow. can't, they can't, yeah, they can't sit on this forever, but technically they can really, without you getting much recourse, get at least three months without you saying, come on. And yeah. six months would be an all out 
limit, you know. So I, I think in the next two to three months I'd expect him to come out with some kind of judgment. And then I have grounds of appeal, and this is what I've done before. What happens from them, depending on what he does, I then go to the Court of Appeal. Mm-hmm. And I, the last two times I've been in the Court of Appeal, um, I've actually been successful. The last one was maintaining the names of um, the head of DCJ and the head of the DPP, those two individuals, Michael Kuchtrider and Lloyd Babb. I've got their, I kept their names on a malicious prosecution against them for their part in what's happened to myself and Andrew. So that was my last win in the Court of Appeal. So I, I, I have some skills now and I know, I believe that if, if he doesn't find in our favour here, I'm confident I'll win it on appeal. But I feel that he's going to have to do something. I don't think... It's too the argument's too strong for him to just not do anything here, you know. Like yeah. it's, so, so I think we'll get some kind of result in the next two to three months, and then I've got clearly, if it's not in our favour, or even part not in our favour, I no doubt will appeal that to the court of appeal to get this thing Incredible. fixed one way or another. Because I think that's the only way we can bring about the change we need. If we can get this this one hundred five thing repealed. And actually change legislation. When it comes from the ground up like this, from a movement of people and support of parents, recognising what's happening and they can see and feel and know that there is a voice at least out there now in the system that's got further than anyone else. Yeah. You know, it's you know, hope. It's, it's hope, hope, you know. And we do have to thank Little Chase for that. And I will say his name at this point for that. But we have to thank Little Chase for that because he, he woke a lot of people up and I in my life have never met an individual that couldn't speak, that was so disadvantaged in one way, that's touched so many hearts. Um, I think he's done an astounding job to raise awareness, that young man. He's highly intelligent. Um, so we need to really have to give thanks for that because he did always say to me, and people won't understand that he can talk, because he does, he talks on a different level to what people understand. Um, but he always did make that very clear to me. He said it was never about me. It was about all the children. He was always very clear about that, you know. So I think there's a spiritual thing at play too. Yeah. I really do. Yeah. Um, it's a lot more than us. I didn't choose this, you know, like all of us. So so where to, I think we just have to stay positive. We have to encourage and empower parents to recognise that there is hope. And I think one way or another, I really believe that a lot of these children are coming home now if we can do it judicially and the system can rise mm-hmm. to the occasion and change, that's great. But if it doesn't, I think I think they're coming home anyway. Yeah. I think it's been too long. And okay. I don't know where, where we're heading in the next months to year or two coming. It's going to be really intense and possibly a very, very difficult time. But nonetheless, this has got to come out. It has to come out, doesn't it? Mm. Yeah. yeah. It's, yeah. It's, um it's going to be a bit chaotic because things break down. They're not working at the moment. Like you just have to listen to these stories and we can't go on like this. It, it all needs to be exposed. No. So, you know, I said I, I condone like non-violence of any kind. I really yes. don't, don't because it's, you, you become the monster. Mm-hmm. So don't, you know, I can't, I can't condone violence. But you do have a right to defend. You have a right to self-defend. Mm-hmm. So I will defend children and grandchildren in their community. And I'm not going to let any of them go with these people. No, I'm very clear. We're very clear. And we have a strong community. So, you know, nonviolence, I think, um, you know, music's good. Comedy helps people a lot to have a sense of humour as <laughs> difficult as all this because it's so horrific that we really need to help these families and yeah. find a way through. And, and social empowerment, you know, really empower these people um, to really take hold of their own personal power. Um, because they do a much better job than these representatives, and to, and to lawfully challenge, and that just okay. that's just everyone go hell for leather, really, at yeah. this thing, and using all the, all yeah. the weapons that we've got, throw them all at it, you know. But it's time, isn't it? It, it, it just is time. Yeah, you know, and pray, pray and meditate too, like yes. really centre, you know, and don't let the anger get you because they use it against you. They do this to parents all the time, you know. They, mm. they just use their own anger against them, you know. So smarten up, you know, like really. Um, and there are people out there like us. There's a, I'm one, but there's many of us now. There's a lot more people coming and, and, grow, and the numbers are growing quickly. The awareness is growing. So, you know, I, th- I think we're in for a, quite a journey. Yeah, yeah. definitely. Yeah. And you've done an amazing job of bringing together a community of, um, of families that have been so traumatised and felt so just lost, I believe, and so disempowered by the system and really giving them hope. So 
I'll, yeah. I'll pop your details of your website below. Um, below this yeah, website. you can you put my email down. You can even put, I mean, I'm getting smashed, but my, I do respond to all emails. That's the best way for me. Um, just sure. pastor.paul at fpn.net.au is the best one because I use that one for all of this kind of stuff. If anyone wants help or assistance, what we always ask with our network is, if they're capable and they've got their, their skills are such that they can, because some people, mm-hmm. remember, can't even use internet, and we deal with people with very limited skills sometimes. There's a lot of social empowerment issues. But notwithstanding that, a brief summary of their matter, you know, what jurisdiction they're in, how long it's been since their children were removed, when their next court matter is, how old the kids are, a basic background on what happened. Um, that's the the best thing for us to start because the minute I get that kind of history, I can then share it. And with us, Charles McGavin, there's a whole bunch of us, Dean McLaughlin. Mm-hmm. We've got journalists as well now that are writing about these stories respectfully and not breaking the laws, but we're trying to get the things out when the people want yeah. the stories told. I think we're going to do more of that as well. So, yeah, so to drop an email to me, we, at least then we can respond quickly. Um, Obviously, if it's a traumatic situation on a Friday with a child being removed, we get those calls as well. The Family Preservation, I think, fpn.net.au has got a 1-800 number. Um, they go to my, directly to my mobile and Charles and D, like one's in West Australia, one's in Victoria, one's in New South Wales. Unfortunately, I'm one man covering New South Wales and Queensland, which is, you know. It's a big job. Um, it's a little bit <laughs> impossible, technically. But that 1-800 number comes up on the fpn.net.au website. Um, that's really important. And I think too, Gabby, for people that they haven't come in their life yet, this is the most important thing. We look at it like coal seam gas. Once DCJ, and we call them in New South Wales, these people come into your place and you allow them in, they start building cases against you and they seem yeah. geared at removing children, not helping support you. Yeah, there's no but support solution. There is no support. Yeah. Yeah. So we've got to get the message out to people about that too, to not let them in, but don't ignore them because if you ignore them, that becomes a flag of risk of significant harm. So you can't not engage. You can't run away when they contact you. You can say no. But you can say no, and you don't have to let them in your house. You have rights to privacy. So there's always get them to put things into emails. You know, get them to send you an email. It's hugely important, and get it in writing what they want because otherwise they don't even tell you and. This is, you know, so we, yeah, evidence. So that's that's really good advice. But this is really important for people before they get into their lives, mm-hmm. and and do what you can to repair relationships with exes and and family members that have got the shits and stuff like. We, we don't need enemies, yeah. Um, people, vindictive people, are causing so much suffering, you know, um, by phoning up and it's one report can, you know, one vindictive shit of a human being can dob someone else in and that can be their, that that person could end up losing their, their losing their child without a shred of evidence you know this is how bad the system is it shouldn't be like that but do what you can to avoid those things with people that are vindictive because they will drop you in it you know yeah. so i always encourage parents everywhere we always try to get them say look you guys don't have to agree on everything but please mm. for the sake of your children drop this you know if- you know children first mm, absolutely yeah absolutely well, that's, that's incredible advice and for our supporters that are listening today how can we help you and help these families is there anything that we can do well spreading this information particularly Crazy. about what to do when they come into your life let people know exactly. beforehand because that's firstly the most important thing to do the second thing is people do need help there is a place to go and there are people like us around so we can at least connect you with a network um, build community uh, make sure you're not on your own if you're a single mum you know that there's other people around to help keep an eye on you because they're less likely to come when you've got those supports so those things but i think most probably raising awareness at this time we do need administrative support massively and we're not quite sure how to do that we've all been talking about this but i i try to help parents all the time and i'm trying to socially empower them by doing affidavits and the affidavits are pretty simple at law but a lot of people are not very skilled and they need support so we're trying to set up a network of people with simple administrative skills that you know that that know enough of the laws and we're also i forgot to mention too we're also helping parents take out statements of claims against caseworkers because of my win last year in the court of appeal you can now take you can now sue a caseworker in their personal name so a lot of people too want they want 
They want justice. So you can now do that, and it's tricky, but you can actually. There are torts that exist, like, you know, misfeasance, malfeasance, but there are ones around parental alienation because a lot of these departments are way overboard. They don't have to cut off all contact. They don't have to do those mm. things for such small things. So, yeah. So, really, aside from spreading the word, being more aware, trying to raise awareness about what to do before they come in, that will be hugely helpful. Amazing. Because they cut it off at the pass. That will mean we won't have to deal with so many. Preventive. Already, yeah, preventive. Yeah. That's the real trick, cut them at the gate. Yeah, and, and that way lot, families aren't going through this trauma. Um, yeah. And know, and know your rights, hugely important. Know your constitution, your common law, and your God-given rights. Know them. Know your rights of trespass. People have forgotten, you see. Yeah. Your home is your castle. You, don't, you have a right to privacy. You don't have to let them in. Just because they say stuff is like doesn't mean you have to let them in your house. Most yeah. people are so nice, they say, oh, I've got nothing to hide. I'll let them in because I can see, they can then see I'm a really nice person. <laughs> right? It doesn't now, work that way. <laughs> it doesn't work that way. They don't, mm. um, so this is hugely, I'm laughing because it's so tragic. It's like Monty yeah. Python because it is, it's so bad. But that's, this is the problem. So don't, you know, um, you don't have to do that. You have to be firm right at the beginning and say, no, no, this is my home. You know, you don't have any grounds to come here. Look, I'm, I'm happy to talk with you at some point about this, but no, I don't want you in my home. We can meet somewhere or I'll come to your office, you know, and I've got to take care of my children first. That's my first responsibility. Of course, it's always about the best interest of the children. You know, mm -hmm. so it's how you conduct yourself in that. And don't yeah. say just sod off or go away, because if you do that, that's a flag. And we deal this a lot. Parents can freak out and then they can say, I don't want you in my life. Well, right. And once they do that, that's a flag. They'll come and take your kid. Mm -hmm. you know? So this is recognize those mechanisms and how they work, you know, and build community and support each other. There's a lot of parents out there now. People are not alone. Don't they, you've, a lot of parents feel isolated, but it's actually not. There's thousands of them. We do have Zoom meetings too now every week that are mm -hmm. growing. Thursday night, I can send you info on that. But yeah, more and more, yeah, more and more people are coming on board, and we're creating all these Zoom groups because of all the COVID stuff. At least there's some yeah. sense of community support. and awesome. support, and people they can talk with and look for advice. And Charles is on there, Dean McLaughlin, Graham Bell comes on. There's some really good people with good advice. Sometimes people don't like to hear the truth, but nonetheless, we have to be forthright about how we manage stuff. Yeah. So. But that's too empowering for people because they realize it's like, wow, I'm not alone. I'm there's not lots, alone. There's yeah. lots of parents like me that are going through this, you know, and, you know, um, that's really empowering because then they feel like, you know what, I can manage this. I can do this. Oh, you know? Yeah. So and pray and meditate. Yes. Paramount. Spiritual foundation is yeah. paramount. You know, do your prayers first and beginning of the, morning, of the morning or your meditation, whatever works for you, but get yourself into a good space as much as you can because wow. we've got we've all got a lot coming our way. Yeah, we've got a marathon now of mm. getting through this, So, mm. but it started. So thank you so much, Paul. I think that was incredible advice about what we can all do and just to stay heart-centred and, and remember our rights. We are sovereign. Mm. Um, and these, the, every time we challenge these systems, whether it's in court like you're doing or whether, mm. whether it's parents saying, no, mm. this doesn't sound right, I'm going to look into my options, you know, we're, we're breaking down these systems, we're, we're challenging them. Mm. Um, we must do that for the children at the moment. So mm. thank mm. you so much. No, my pleasure, Gabby. Yeah, my pleasure. And, yeah, please, um, if you can send me through your details, I'll pop them. Um, yeah. There as well for families to reach out to as well. Yeah, cool. Beautiful. Wonderful. Right. Well, you have a lovely afternoon and I will I look forward to hearing about the case as well. Please keep Yeah, I, I will keep you informed, definitely. Yeah, we're praying for that one for all these families that need need it yeah, to come. Uh, absolutely. And let's hope we get a lot more kind of positive things like this happening too. Yes. We get a lot more parents yeah. on the front feet challenging. On a yeah. roll. Well, I, it was interesting to see Brian Houston being charged yesterday. Yeah, a lot of people are very happy about that one. Yeah, let's yeah. let that roll. So that's, that's a big one. Hopefully mm. we've got positive changes happening in Australia. Yeah, I think a lot of people too challenging <clears throat> a lot of the, what I call the highly disproportionate response to the SARS-CoV-2 virus. It's my yes. position on it because what I see is like, my God. Yes. You know? But anyway, there's a lot of people lawfully challenging too. So just there's lots of, to learn around that. And we're, we're trying yeah. to empower people around those things too. Definitely. You know, with the legislation because things are not what they seem. And once you know the laws, you can, 
you can get you can do an awful lot they're not that smart <laughs> yeah but isn't it it's amazing to see so many people standing up and taking action like all in different areas but it's all working together as well yeah yeah <laughs> yeah now we're seeing more and more groups kind of joining up everywhere which is good it's about time no. That's I think people are realizing that we don't have to agree with everything, but we've all got this no. common in, common intent and common goal at the end. Yeah. So we can. It's it's a bit like um, it's like Lord of the Rings, really, isn't it? <laughs> you know, like really? you've got to get you've got to get the dwarfs and the elves and the hobbits and everyone all working together to take down Mordor. <laughs> Yeah. And so we all have to go, oh, well, we're all a bit different. I'm definitely an elf, you know, an elf kind of turning into a wizard. Yeah. <laughs> I'm an enemy. Yeah. 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 Awesome. Mm. Well, you have a lovely afternoon, Paul, and um, thank you yeah. so much for everything right. today. And we'll Be talk soon. Friend. All right. Bye-bye. Right. God, God bless. Talk to you soon.